they have logged in. So Simon, we're ready to get started. Yep, I've started the recording, so off you go if you like, um, Lauren. Great. So I want to welcome everybody to the Faith Getting Started Guide and Balsa Overview two-part webinar series. Today we will be discussing the Getting Started Guide and tomorrow's session will be on Balsa. This webinar will be recorded so you can access it at a later date if needed. I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Lauren Russo from the Open Group and I'm the Forum Coordinator for the Future Airborne Capability Environment Consortium. I also have here with me Dave Wounsbury, who is the Chief Technical Officer for the Open Group. Hello, everybody. And I'd also like to introduce our panelists that we have today. We have Dr. Alicia Taylor, who is IT Project and Planning Analyst supporting U.S. Army PO Aviation, and she also serves as the Chair of the Integration Workshop Standing Committee. Stephen Seeming, who is Vice President and Program Manager for Military Aviation Programs for TES Savvy, and is also the Vice Chair of the Integration Workshop Standing Committee. Good and Tom Brixey, a Senior Software and Systems Engineer and member of the Data Modeling Staff for TES Savvy Military Aviation Systems Division. He's also an active participant in the Integration Workshop and Data Architecture Working Group, as well as many other subcommittees in the consortium. For those of you who are not familiar with the FACE Consortium, we are a government and industry collaborative organization under the umbrella of the Open Group, which is a global organization that focuses on achieving business objectives through the use of open standards. The FACE Consortium is, uses the approach as a government industry software standard and business strategy that we're using to enable folks to acquire affordable software systems, rapidly integrate portable capabilities across global defense programs, and attract innovation and deploy it quickly and affordably. I mentioned earlier that we developed through industry and government collaboration via the Open Group, and we currently have 90 plus organizations and over 1,100 participants on our FACE Consortium mailing roster, which has grown exponentially over the past six years. The benefits to government using an open standard collaborative approach between industry and government is better buying power, increased competition, achieve affordability, and control life cycle costs of the multiple programs for the various aircrafts that are out there. We want to incentivize productivity and innovation in industry and government, and ultimately reduce software development time, saving time and money through modularity and portability. Also for cross-platform decision-making, reuse is the primary use for the FACE approach, not investing multiple times for the same capability, in enabling integration of cross-program requirements. The industry benefits as well. The FACE approach enables industry to create software-centric product lines, opportunities to develop capabilities, wants, and use it for multiple customers across multiple platforms. It also provides opportunity for software capability across multiple aircraft types, which may have not been available before when they were supplying for one customer. It enables them to get into a market where multiple customers can benefit from the capability. It lowers costs of doing business, common standards, lower costs and schedule risks. Developed once, the quality assurance is done once, and if it's proven once, it's proven to work in multiple environments. Standardization allows for rapid development of capabilities and reuse of software application enables integrators to optimize platform performance. If they have tested it once and integrated it once, the learning curve goes down and folks can do things more rapidly. And the ultimate goal is to get high quality capability to the warfighter faster and in a more cost effective way. For more information on the FACE approach, you can go to our FACE landing page, which is accessible at www.opengroup.org slash FACE. This is our public site. We do have a collaboration site that we use for members only. And if you're interested in joining the consortium and want some more information, we can give that to you by sending an email to ogface-admin at opengroup.org. On this landing page, it will give you information on the consortium activities, membership, published documents and tools that we use for developing FACE software, recent procurements, a link to the FACE registry, and also information on how to navigate through the conformance process. 
On our main landing page, you'll find a section called Documents and Tools, and under that section, you can find published documents as well as the newly published Software Supplier Getting Started Guide, which our panelists will be giving you more detailed information about shortly. And also on the main Open Group website, www.opengroup.org, under Publications, you can search for the Software Supplier Getting Started Guide, and this will allow you to download the document as a PDF as shown on the slide. And if you have any questions during this webinar, we ask that you use the Q&A section, and we will try to answer as many questions as we can. If we don't get to you, you can send your questions to ogface-admin at opengroup.org, and somebody from the team will get back to you and get you the answers that you're looking for. And with that, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Alicia Taylor. She's going to give you a bit of a background on the Integration Workshop Standing Committee and the Software Supplier Getting Started Guide. Over to you, Alicia. Thank you, Lauren. Um, the Integration Workshop Standing Committee actually uh, developed the Software Supplier Getting Started Guide, and I noticed that several of the attendees uh, participate in the Integration Workshop Standing Guide or the Integration Workshop Standing Committee. But I just wanted to point out our charter. Um, looking at the second bullet, it's to discover, evaluate, and produce face reference implementation examples and facilitate adoption and publication of these examples. Uh, the software supplier is just one example of some things that, that we do. Um, I've also highlighted a few things, the face Tim and conference events. One of the things that the integration workshop does in conjunction with the technical working group is to review the papers and uh, kind of help with the coordination of the presentations. And you can see some information there on um, the previous TIMs. We also host what's called a BITS event, which is just an integration event. Lauren mentioned that integration once and learning curve, your learning curve goes down. That's kind of the idea behind the BITS event, is it gives you an opportunity to integrate software um, with BALSA, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And then, um, as you can tell, this last event in June, we had four teams, but we had 10 face organizations presenting. So that means there's a lot of integration going on between companies and between software. Uh, we've also looked at the code challenge. I mentioned the software supplier getting started guide, uh, BALSA code, data models, and user guides. So um, I just wanted to kind of touch on that just a little bit. And what I'm going to do is just walk us through at least the first part of the Software Supplier Getting Started Guide. So just bear with me, and I will um, share my screen and get up and running on that. So looking at the table of contents, you can see the first chapter, the first section is divided just into primary documents. There are certainly more documents that the software supplier getting started guide are, excuse me, there are more documents than the FACE organization, the FACE consortium produces. These are just some that are highlighted for the software supplier. Then we've got chapter two, which kind of walks us through some of the environment, uh, units of conformance, data modeling, artifacts. We'll spend a little bit more time, or at least um, both Chris Cook, who's a subject matter expert for BALSA, um, will be one of the presenters tomorrow, and he will focus a little bit more on BALSA. Uh, today we've got, following me, will be Stephen Simming. Uh, Stephen is going to talk a little bit about the artifacts, the conformance test suite, and will key on uh, Appendix A with the testing for the face conformance. Or, sorry, the Face conformance test suite. I probably should finish my statement. Um, just kind of scrolling down, uh, we've got a number of tables in there that we tried to highlight some things. And then going down to our first section. Uh, the Software Supplier Getting Started Guide is designed to be a navigational quick start guide for software suppliers. What it's not is it's not an overall view of face. This is geared, geared primarily to the software supplier. A software supplier is really anyone who's providing software to be certified as face conformant or just anyone who's interested in knowing more information. 
Um, we use BALSA, which is the basic avionics lightweight source archetype as the application. It's an own ramp example. One of our philosophies is you learn by doing and the BALSA software is actually available for, to you or anyone in the FACE consortium to play with, to integrate, to basically just do whatever you'd like to, if you'd like to add to it, certainly there's that as well. And again, I mentioned more information is found in Chapter 2. There are four primarily goals of the Software Supplier Getting Started Guide. It's just to provide startup guidance, highlighting basic information, uh, looking at an application, and then I mentioned learning by doing approach where you can download, explore, analyze, update, integrate, test, et cetera. And then we also want to assist you in gaining more understanding of the verification process. And this is one of the things that highlights the, or that separates the FACE consortium with the FACE Open Architect. It's a little bit different. It has not just the technical approach, but the business approach, but it also has that verification and certification that allows you to certify that software does meet uh, the requirements of the FACE technical standard. Primary documents, uh, Lauren mentioned the landing page. You can get to that. She also mentioned the documents and tools section. That's one of the things that I'm just pulling out some documents here. I do want to point out that um, we recommend that you use the most current edition for new development and verification unless you're contractually required to use a previous edition. Uh, downloading information in some cases uh, it does require a password, but that is free of charge, and you must have a, a valid email address. The first document I want to point out is just the FACE overview. If you're brand new to the FACE consortium or want to learn just a little bit more about it, we recommend that you start with the FACE overview. There's also a FACE 101 technical briefing um, that's very good. We also are working on getting some updated information. Um, not just about the FACE 101, but something a little bit more kind of specific that we'll talk about the technical business and data modeling overview. Our FACE technical standard is basically our, our keystone document, and all the other documentation kind of supports that. Uh, you may not know, but each edition of the technical standard has a corresponding uh, rig, shared data model, um, shared data model or data model governance plan, conformance verification matrix, and then a conformance test suite. Um, the RIG, again, just provides some best practices. It provides example scenarios, and it does go into uh, a lot of detail, but it's just a, a, something that helps you understand the technical standard. I mentioned the conformance publication and tools. Uh, we've got a number of things there, in, in, including some information on FACE Conforma 101, a certification guide, the verification matrix, the matrix uh, user's guide to assist you in interpreting information, uh, the conformance test suite. It's a test tool that measures um, whether or not your interfaces or applications are built to the technical standard. And please ensure that if you're using Tech Standard 2.1, that you make sure that the conformance test suite that you're using aligns with that. There's also third-party tools and applications, which can be very beneficial to you. Um, these are not necessarily verified that they do pass conformance, but these are just additional tools that are supported by third-party vendors. And then we recognize in the FACE Consortium that um, our documents may have issues, probably not often, but occasionally that does happen. Or somebody might like to have more information or something else included. We have what's called a PRCR process, a problem report, a change report. And looking at this, basically your, your PR report uh, helps you, it prevents a unit of conformance from obtaining a certification certificate and a CR, a change request, simply means that you've identified an issue that you would like to see included in a consortium product. And um, the last item I want to highlight is just the FACE contract guide. And then that brings us down to um, Chapter 2, which again provides an overview. It talks a little bit more about setting up an environment, BALSA, how to use, how to operate BALSA, data model. Most of that will be covered tomorrow. However, um, Stephen Simi, I want to turn that over to you. I think you're our next presenter, 
and you're going to talk a little bit more about um, kind of an, a, a brief overview here and then maybe uh, data modeling and then running the conformance test suite. So, Stephen? I'm getting control of the pass on that. Okay. Uh, let me share my desk screen. Well, good day. This is Stephen Simi, and I'm here with Mr. Tom Brixey, both to ES Savvy. I'm also the vice chair of the Face Integration Workshop with Alicia. Um, to ES Savvy's been face member since the inception of 2010, and we're also a VA. Um, together, Tom and I are going to leverage Alicia's introduction. We're going to present the contents of the Getting Started Guide and step through an example so you become familiar with the design and the flow of this important document. But first, how did we get this um, document? When the in integration workshop was incubated, it's almost four years, about three years ago, the issue was there's a mass quantity of very good technical information that is unfortunately hard to navigate. Overwhelming is a word that was often used, and it's okay. It's still good information and improving along with the standard. Um, so the integration workshop was formed with the charter to help product development, help the ecosystem products, and help facilitate others to embrace product developments using the technical standard. So the initial task was this getting started guide. As we mentioned, a navigational quick start guide that helps readers navigate through the plethora of face products. The reader should quickly locate what they need, what they want, and literally grab a working example and run that example on their own machines, which is useful indeed. Um, essentially, as a 30 plus developer, I found that when you have something that works on your own machine, then you can say you're on the on-ramp of the developer highway and ready to progress. So we can hack examples and go from there. The other thing on this guide is keeping it simple. As we look at the table of contents, you can see a lot of these sections, the authors limited it to about five pages per topic or per section. That's not always the case, but mostly the case, where you grab a working example and show execution. So that should be the common theme to the reader is get something, grab it. It's kind of akin to when you're at the grocery store, you got that kind of contents at the end of the list. You can see what's there. Go down there if you want it. So as it's mentioned, a lot of very good documents up front. I typically go through a table of contents because it gives you a preview from beginning to end of the document. Um, so we got a bunch of helpful documents up front. Um, essentially then, one of the first things you do is you set up your work environment. Um, this is one of the challenges we have in FACE because FACE is a software product that's agnostic to hardware systems and operating systems. So where we try to be prescriptive, we can't be at the same time. So bear with us on the um, abstractions. So we try to give you an example, but we can't say one operating system's better than the other, one tool suite's better than the other. That's just the way we how we have to operate. So at first, you set up your environment. Here's a couple of examples of how to target the operating systems and grabbing the example. Chris tomorrow is going to go through um, section 2.3 and 2.4 of the data model, so I'll, I'll defer that till tomorrow's uh, webinar. Um, essentially then, uh, we have a descriptive section here. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm jumping too fast. Um, data modeling use the FACE standard. It's a t uh, very descriptive about how FACE data modeling is. Um, after you're done getting an environment and the software applications together, you're only part of way through the FACE conformance process. The next thing to do is have artifacts that are used with the face verification products. Um, we'll, we'll actually show you how to test your application, but then there's some other things that the verification authorities are going to require to ensure that all face requirements are met, and those are met through um, an analysis of artifacts. So we have a section in here is what are the conformance artifacts and an example of how you would actually map your artifacts to a requirement. Then, last but not least, section 2.6 is when you have your product running and your artifacts together is to locate a verification authority and go through the verification process and conformance process. 
So we have how to log in, how to find a VA, and then essentially it ends with that, we'll talk about it at the end of this example, um, pro, uh, reporting problems and change reports, because it's actually quite useful and um, will be used. But what Tom and I are going to do is we're going to go through this example of sec in, uh, Appendix A, obtaining a face user supplied um, data model and testing using the face conformance test suite. We assume, like most people, as you're new, you don't know what a data model it is, you don't know what the conformance test suite is, you don't know how to get access to anything. So we're going to just walk you through this one section. We together authored it and um, run it through. So I will step through the actual document first. It all should be hot linked. And so Appendix A is what we're walking through. It describes what you're doing. Basically, you'll pull down the face user supply data model, um, and then you'll add in your own data model, which is the description of messages that are being passed through the um, architecture there. One of the first things you need to do is get access to some documents. Um, there's some performance documents, and let's go ahead and grab the test suite. These are all linked. So if it loads correctly, it takes you to a place on the FACE website, and we're going to get some test suites. And this particular one, which one are we grabbing here, Tom? Let's turn 213 to 213. 213 is, so we picked one to run through the example. So we got 214, a little bit further down. 213, we'll grab the zip file or the tar file. Let's take the tar file. All right. Click on it, and it should download if I'm connected to the internet. Doesn't look like it's downloading. What happens is you download it. There we go. Takes a few seconds or a little longer. And you'll pull down the file onto your own machine. Back to Word. We got the conformance test suite. Um, we need to then grab an example of some data model. Oh, here's the tools. Disclaimer on the tools, there's, a, again, an ecosystem. These tools are not vetted by the FACE consortium, but again, they are useful. The next thing you need to do is grab a data model, the shared data model, and we're grabbing edition 2.1. Okay, and we will load the FACE data model, should download. So we download the face data model. Are you guys seeing this now on the screen? Is it showing well? Okay. So we've got the conformance test suite and the data model loaded. Um, we provided, as a part of the consortium, provided a, an example um, data model under the third party tools. So if you wanted to access that, you could. Whole bunch of tools that are available Publications, well, I wanted to show the third-party tools first. Um, it's not grabbing me to that. Let me try again. This one was slower this morning when we tested it. What we can do is we'll just pull it this way. Okay, third-party tools in your applications, um, a whole bunch of different test suites. Again, these are not vetted by the open group, but they're available. What we did is we had a data model. We put the data model up there, so you have access to that. Scrolling down, we took the 3.0, correct? 3.1, sir. The 3.1, pull that down. So now in my download files, as it's downloading, I have a conformance test suite, the shared data model, and we also should now have an example of a user supplied model here. So with that, I'm going to then get, I'm gonna go through the, the deck first and then we'll pass it over to Tom. I do that because 
Um, the conformance test suite will not run on a Macintosh, so we have a Linux box next to us here. So we're going to fire up the conformance test suite, configure, it, configure the data model, bring in our user supplied model, configure the test suite tools, which means you select which um, components you want to test, and then run the test. The test takes about three minutes to run, so while we're running that, he's going to pass the ball back to me, and we'll show you the data model, and then we'll go back and interpret the results. So again, what we should have is access to all the tools, working examples, and running through. So I'm going to go ahead and pass this over to you, Tom. All right. Stop sharing. be able to share your screen. Very good. Thank Very you. good. So what we have here is a representative Linux platform. Steve had mentioned that we have the test suite for looking at a terminal containing the test suite 213 right now. And we also have a terminal view of the data models themselves. We have our ADSB model that's from the third party site. And today we're going to compare that against since it was built against the uh, phase 2131 shared data model. So to fire this up, what we'll need to do here is we need to run the script that's provided within the CTS itself. And we'll bring this up and we'll see the UI that Stephen pointed out. Here we go. Do our configurations. Today we're going to run a data model test. So we'll just concern ourselves with that, our shared data model which is contained within data model directory. I happen to have it conveniently on the desktop today. So let's see here. Shared data model goes in first. Open that up. Uh, and then the USM is also having the same folder. And on the correct load, what we should get presented is from our USM, we should get all the UOPs that are going to be uh, capable for being tested. We're going to select them all. Let's go ahead and load it up, though. So here we go. We have our four. And I'll check all four here. And after we run the test, you should see each one of these components loaded. Absolutely. And then we'll show you the data model, what it looks like while it's running. Correct. And we'll just take the defaults for saving off our config today, just for sake of example. OK. And OK, and all's good, seems to be. Let's test our data model. And we're off. I'm passing back over. Yes, sir. Or I can just grab it. Grab it. I don't think I can because I'm not the percentage. There we go. All right, for those of you who would like to see what the data model looks like when we're running it, okay. Um, Tom clicked off during the configuration of the user supply data model components corresponding to the ATC PCS component, the platform configuration, the ADS transponder component, and the Iggy component in there. So if we go from the top level, what a face data model, here's what we downloaded. It's actually conceptual module, all logical module, the platform model, and then the UOP is the one that we've downloaded off the site there. And this is what we're testing. And if Tom, you're finished testing. Not uh, quite there. Not quite there. Um, there are some other additional information in Appendix B about data modeling. And we'll probably get some more data modeling training with a particular um, course there. So I'm going to get back to stop sharing and pass the ball over to you so we can show the results of the test. Oh, and the results are in. So what we're seeing here is that true to form, 
our data model configuration that we want to show test four when our UOP is tested. We have the ATC PCS component and the four components here as we have listed out. And sure enough, they all passed with this. Scroll down to the other elements. Yes, I will. There we go. So they're consisted of uh, <clears throat> three main components within the test itself. It's the meta model validation, which is, is it a properly formed model by virtue of the base 2.1 meta model? Along with that, uh, as found in the data model governance plan are the OCL constraints check, as well as the shared data model conformance, which would be things that perhaps might be uh, a question if we had an observable or something of that effect in regards to follow-on activity to get processed by the change control board. Um, we have a passing model with the peers here, Steve. Thank you very much. Send it back over. Okay, and I'll share my desktop. And Stephen, while you're doing that, there's a question that says, will we need a particular data modeling tool or is one provided? Um, on that third party tools are some free tools and some tools for sale that you can peruse. I showed you one that's actually the one that we develop in house. That's the one we're used to using. So that's the one that I showed you a little while ago. Um, so the third-party tools, you can get um, data modeling uh, capabilities there in the ecosystem. So just to recap here, um, the results passed, um, the data model passed, and now there's additional data modeling training also on the same site. And what I wanted to do is what we'll find out because the, the standard is evolving. So what you're going to find out is as you create more robust um, products, it's very likely that the shared data model will need additional elements added into the tools. So we will need to use the PRCR process and add those in. So what I'm going to do is go back to section 2.6 really quickly if we have more time. Boop, 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 boop. Oh, went too far, sorry. Table of contents, 2.6. All right, so let's assume you have your product together, um, your artifacts together. Probably the first thing you need to do is to locate a VA. Um, this is a section that identifies how to do that. The conformance process talks about it. Now what happens is, you will need to identify if there are um, issues that the data model needs a new element added in the, uh, for you to pass conformance. Here's the ticketing system for the change reports and you know, not, all, not all changes are bad. This means addition to the shared data model. But here's how you get to actual processing and checking that and Tom did a good job of actually how we track that example. It's in another appendices. So with that, um, we've presented the contents of the Getting Started Guide, and we actually showed you through an example of um, how the flow and design is for the document. So I think we're at a good place to ask and address any questions at that point. Simon, do you want to take it back? If anybody does have any questions, we don't have any right now in our Q&A section, but please send them along in the Q&A section or the chat section. and we can get you an answer. Um, we have had a few folks ask if there'll be um, a link to record the webinar, and I want to let everyone know that if you register for the event, you'll get an email with the link to the recording, and we'll also make this available on our website as well. So please type your questions in, and we'll give everyone a few minutes if there are any questions. And just as a reminder, tomorrow at 2 o'clock, Central Time, 3 o'clock Eastern, 
uh, we will spend a little bit more time on the sections dealing with balsa, how to access the bulk, how to access balsa, how to get it up and running, um, all the balsa guide, all the other documentation, including an, another data model, will be included in the, um, the package for those of you that are consortium members. Um, if you're not a consortium member right now, just bear with us for a couple of weeks. You will not have access to balsa yet. We are in the process of getting it through PAO approval. So it uh, looks like there's a question. How are DO 178 issues managed? Example, um, oops, sorry, let me pull those back up. Um, how did DO? How are DO 178 issues managed, for example, uh, tool certification, et cetera? Uh, Stephen? Yeah. Um, as a face VA, um, this is a very good question. Um, primarily, the face standard does not require their worthiness. Uh, but the A in, in, in face is airborne, and we all know that we have a airworthy component. So the question is, how are the 178 issues managed? They're managed outside of the standard. Um, primarily when you're configuring and conforming, verifying, they go to the FACE requirements. That probably means that your contracted application has additional DO 178 requirements, and those objectives need to be satisfied um, elsewhere in your documentation, but it is not within the scope of the FACE um, standard or verification authority. Hopefully that answers your question. There's also a document that I helped co-author. Um, it's an airworthy supplement to FACE. And if you write to me your email, I guess it's Peter Stroud. This is Stephen Seamy. If you write to me your email, I can send you a copy of that particular document. Um, and it's, it's an adjunct document um, that, that kind of says what is the, uh, it, it hits the, the heart of your question. Okay, the next question is, will BALSA example be updated to the Edition 3.0 technical standard? Currently, BALSA is aligned with uh, technical standard 2.1. Actually, it's already in the process of being updated to 3.0, as a matter of fact, uh, we use some updates um, to BALSA to test some of the um, supporting information in alignment with Tech Standard 3.0. So it has already been partially updated. Uh, it will be updated to Edition 3.0. I can't give you a timeline on that, but yes, the plan is to update it. Okay. Other questions? Alicia, in the chat, I think there was a follow-up to the first question that came through. It came through via chat, and it is, so we are using 178 certified and face conformant RTOS and face TSS. Stephen? I think it's so are we using. Let me get off mute there, it would help. Okay. <laughs> um, are we using, uh-oh, it keeps, oh, keeps oh. moving there. Yeah, it's, it, was just a, it was just a comment um, that, you know, that this is Dave Lounsbury. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, that, that's, the right, that's the right kind of way of thinking about it, that, you know, that you need to have a component that, that, sort of, that satisfies the DO-178 uh, regime for flight safety, and then face conformance for modularity and reusability. But I, but I think the question, and, and Jeff's question is, is in the current BALSA set, is it a 178 uh, face conformant RTOS? And no, it's not. Um, we do know one of the BITS participants um, actually integrated with the face conformant RTOS, but that's not the baseline for the BALSA set. And there is no face conformant TSS. 
Okay, okay. so um, yeah, Jeff said it's just a comment. Yeah, we do have a few more questions that come through. Um, is there already a text conformance suite for phase 3.0? No, it's in the process. Right. Yeah. yeah it's in. Usually, the tools follow the standard. The standard. Yeah. The standard is not released yet. It's yeah. a snapshot. Um, next question: How hard is it to migrate from phase two dot one to phase three dot zero? We haven't tried that yet. We're learning. Yeah. Well, I would say I think it depends upon what exactly you're doing. Um, you know, a TSS is a little bit more complicated than, you know, PSSS or PCS or something like that. So I think it really depends on what you're doing. Uh, there are some changes, and I think there's working on, there's a group working on kind of some migration approaches, things like that. But really, I think BOSS is probably the only thing that has been migrated, and it hasn't completely been migrated. It's just been using... Um, kind of, I guess, parts of the technical standard. Uh, this may be one of the questions that you want to ask Chris tomorrow, because uh, he's the one that has been working primarily on the, the updates along with uh, Joel Sherrill and some other folks as well. But I would encourage you maybe to ask Chris that question tomorrow. Okay, so, so there's a summary of key changes between 2.1 and 3.0. That's usually published with the standard, um, so that should be coming out. That's Corey's question. And then Pete Strahl has a question. Is the test tool a certified test tool? Yes. Um, you download it off the open site. It is a sanctioned tool, and it's released with each standard, as is a conformance verification matrix is aligned with each standard. Good questions. I don't see any more questions. The chat window, looks like we got it. Mute here. Great, and um, if you do have questions after this webinar ends, please send an email to ogface-admin at opengroup.org and we'll be sure to get you the right answers um, directed to the right people. And again, everybody will get a link of this webinar sent out to share with others, and we thank you for joining. We also encourage you to attend part two tomorrow. And with that, we are done for the day. I wanna thank our panelists for joining and Simon for um, facilitating the webinar for us. Thank you, everyone.